morning and welcome to IP Tables Tips and Tricks. More than just accept and drop. I'm Gary Smith. I work at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, uh, which is in Richland, Washington. That is on the other side of the Cascades where we get maybe five inches of rain a year. If it rains a quarter of an inch in a day, it sets a new record. Um, I'm from Texas, and in Texas we consider rain an inch an hour. So, you know, when they say it's raining in eastern Washington and western eastern Washington, I go, ha ha! You don't know what rain is. Um, as I mentioned, I work at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is a laboratory of the Department of Energy. We do lots of sciencey stuff there. I work in EMSL, the Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory, which as you might guess we do environmental and molecular science. Here are some of our happy researchers doing their stuff. Uh, we have a very large supercomputer there and my task is the security of that supercomputer and all of its supporting infrastructure. So. How do I think about security since that's what I'm tasked with? Well, I think about security by using what I have termed the five golden principles of security. And they are these. If you were in my talk yesterday, you know that PowerPoint, bless its pointy little head, scrambled this slide. So I made sure today that this slide was right. Okay, the five golden principles are know your system, principle of least privilege, defense in depth, protection is key, but detection is must, and know your enemy. I have them arranged this way so that they're easy to remember. No is at the top and the bottom, the central theme is in the middle, and numbers two and four both start with P. Know your system, know what runs on your system, know who uses your system, know how, how the workload goes. The network is the system, so know what goes on on your network. What is your traffic like? Where is it coming in from? Where is it going out to? What is your load? Principle of least privilege. Don't give people, groups, processes, systems, networks any more privilege than they absolutely need to get their job done. Defense in depth, that is the central theme of the whole thing. What you want to do is you want to build a structure of concentric rings around your systems, around your network, around your cloud, whatever, that provides multiple layers of security. The contrast to the idea of defense in depth is something that people still say to this day. I've got a firewall, I must be protected. Right. Okay, protection is key, but detection is a must. You can harden your systems until the cows come home, you can apply patches, but if you don't know that something has gone wrong, you've lost the battle. You have to be able to detect that bad things have happened. Know your enemy. Know what tools he uses. Try those tools yourself. Learn his techniques. Learn to think like him. You'll be ahead of the game. Okay. I started thinking about how I wanted to do this presentation. And I thought, well, okay, how can I do this? And then I had this flashback to the networking class I had in graduate school. And this was a 6 to 9.30 class once a week. And the professor just stood up there and he flashed slide after slide after slide after slide after slide. And by probably, oh, 7.30 or so, we were pretty numb. So I decided, okay, that is not what I'm going to do. I am not going to just flash tip after tip or IP tables rule after IP tables rule up here until you start thinking, well, okay, what was on slide number 43? I don't remember anything about that. I tried to do something different on the way I organized this. So I started thinking, okay, well, if I were going, if I were sitting in the audience, what would I want to see as the first tip slash trick that would be most beneficial to me as a potential mucker of IP tables rules. And I came up with this idea as the first thing to present. 
how to avoid locking yourself out when you muck with IP tables. Because I can tell you from personal experience, I've done this to myself. And I've done it to lots of other people. So hopefully, here's some little tips and tricks you can use. You want to make changes to your IP tables rules. And you want to avoid locking yourself out and potentially the rest of the company or a large segment of your users. Um, if you feel that you are not being properly appreciated, do something wrong with your IP tables rules and lots of people will be standing in your doorway wondering what's going on and what did you do. Your popularity will increase. Um, if you don't do it right and you lock everybody out, uh, this can cost time and money. Um, maybe not your job, but you will definitely uh, have a lot more attention than you probably wanted to know. Um, tip number one, save a copy of your current IP tables rules. This is really easy. There's a command line command to do this. IP tables save and put it wherever you want to put it. IP tables works. Whatever name works for you. That's really neat. Okay. A slightly better thing that you can do is you can put a timestamp as part of the file name by saying IP table save directed it somewhere. And how many people here know French? Anybody want to admit to knowing French? Okay. <laughs> All right. This is this little diacritical symbol is called the accent grave, but most people usually call it back tick. Back tick date plus percent f back tick. What that tells the shell is, do this first. Execute this command, date plus percent f. That turns out to be this string here in, the, in this particular example. Year, month, date. That becomes part of the file name. So you end up with a file name that's readily identifiable as when you created the file. Okay. So it becomes real easy to restore it. IP tables restore coming from that file name. Poof. You now got your IP tables back before they were. Um, you can also expand on this a little bit and put get the timestamp with um, hour and minutes in it if you're making if you're really getting granular on your changes. Um, I haven't had to do that, but you can. Uh, another possibility that you can do is that you can make a symbolic link between this dated version and something called IP Tables Works Latest. Then write a little cron script to reload this latest working copy every five minutes while you're testing so that you don't have to remember to copy it back. The cron job will do it, and hopefully five minutes might be a good enough window for you. Uh, you might want to try it every minute if you're really unsure, but I think five minutes is probably okay. Uh, another thing that you can do is make sure that you have an alternate path into the console so that if something goes wrong, you can flush the IP tables if necessary. If you're working on a physical server, probably you can get an IP, IPMI connection in there and get a console that way. If you're working on a VM, you can uh, get to the console through um, a VM session into the, uh, into the console. Um, that way, something goes wrong, you're not locked out. You can get to the console. Uh, another possibility, just in general, is put specific at the rules at the top of your IP tables. I'm going to allow this, I'm going to allow this, I'm going to drop this from this particular address, I'm going to drop this from this particular address. Um, another possibility you can do is put something right at the very top that's got the IP address of your workstation so that you won't get locked out. Everybody else might, but you can quickly do something. Avoid putting generic rules at the top. 
generally what you want to do with your policy is you want to have very specific stuff at the top getting more and more generic as you go down so that when you get to the very bottom you got your very generic rules. Like, okay, I don't know what to do with this, let's just drop it on the floor because it's probably bad. Um, another... Can layer rules override your own ones or does it not work that way? Uh, the way IP tables works is first match wins. That is the rule with IP tables. IP tables works that way. First match wins. And then it stops. And then it stops. That's not true with some IP filtering techniques. There's one called IP filter that was written by Darren Reed in Australia. His stuff works on most recent match wins. So it can traverse all your rules and whichever one one is the most recent match, that's the one that wins. It's a different concept, but that's the trick with IP tables. Most recent, first match wins. It doesn't traverse all of them. First one that matches, poof, we're gone. That's it. Um, should, should that be accepted instead of drop? Um, first one when you're trying to lock, not lock yourself out? Uh, yes. Because that would lock you out. Yeah, it would lock me out. Okay. Sorry. Okay, very good. Yeah, that needs to be accepted. That does need to be accepted. <laughs> you don't necessarily want to drop yourself out. Yep, you need that needs to be accepted. Okay. That's a good thing we have a console. Pardon? Good thing we have the Well, console. that's why you have the console, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Oops, I screwed up. I locked myself out. Well, okay. Fat finger, change, quick. Um, if you're working with systems that have more than one NIC, specify what NIC. What, what ETH or EN0 or whatever it happens to be so that you get more specific. Um, if you specify which interface you're coming in on, you won't necessarily block yourself out if it's on ETH1. Um, more tips for not blocking yourself out. Um, whitelist IP addresses at the top of the rules. Um, this is very effective. Uh, everybody else, not so much. Um, okay, there we are. Input your IP address, except. Um, always put that as the first rule, and remember I is insert, A is append. I sometimes forget that and make a mistake and it's off to the virtual console to fix it. Another tip, know and understand what your policy does. Surprisingly, that's the first rule. Know your system and what's there. Um, if you know what your policy does, that's half the battle right there. Um, if you understand what your policy does, <coughs> your life will be a whole lot easier. If you have to, Draw a flowchart. Think through what it does. Map it out. And I can tell you from personal experience, what the policy does and what it's supposed to do are frequently two different things. I remember going and looking at the policy for another group and thinking about it and going, oh, okay, so this is what it's supposed to do. Well, hmm, nope. But everybody kind of said, oh, this is what it's supposed to do. No, that's not what it was doing. So I ended up having to redo the whole thing. So this is a, if you have to look at somebody else's rules, that's an important thing to remember. Okay. Here's another scenario. You want to set up a workstation with a restrictive firewall policy. What can you do? Well, first step. Set your default policy as drop. A lot of people don't do that. They don't set their default policy as drop. What they do instead is they let the default policy be accept on everything and then put drop rules at the very bottom. Well, that's okay, but you may not be getting exactly what you think you're doing. Um, by setting your default policy as drop, you punch holes through for what you're going to accept so you know what is going in or going out. Here's that 
uh, default policy that I came up with. Filters the table we're going to do this with. And then we set input, drop, input forward, and output to drop. So if we don't, if we don't specifically allow it, it goes on the floor. That being said, we have to start punching things through. So if a connection is established or related to another connection on input or output, we're going to let it through. So it's going to immediately fall through if this has been one that we've accepted. We allow traffic across our local interface. Always a good thing to do. This is very high up in the table, so it won't have to traverse very many rules. This is a workstation. So it probably needs to get DHCP information. It needs to get an IP address, it needs to get a net mask, it needs to get a broadcast mask. It may get a host name. So we're going to allow UDP port 6768 out so it can get its information. And since we have allowed an established or a related connection up here at the top, will fall through when it gets a request coming back in, when it gets information coming back in. Um, allow inbound SSH. You as a system administrator are probably going to want to get into the box and maybe make some adjustments to it. So allow SSH to come in. Allow outbound email. Port 25, we're going to allow the thing to send email out. Need to allow DNS lookups. That way whoever's using the box can get to important things like Facebook and Twitter. Um, outbound pings so that it can see that Facebook and Twitter are actually working. Network time request. It's important for the box to know what time it is so that things can get synchronized. And of course we need to allow HTTP and HTTPS out and then commit saying do it. That's it. We've got a basic workstation set up. They can go out to the web, they can find addresses, they can get booted up on start. You as assistant administrator can get in to make changes if need be. This would be a really good policy if you had a laptop and you're taking it over to Starbucks and you don't want anybody else compromising your box because you're allowing very few things in and very little out. If it doesn't know what to do with it, it gets dropped on the floor automatically because we set that up at the very beginning at our policy. Okay. Another little scenario. Okay. Your employees are spending too much time on Facebook, updating their Facebook pages and reading other people's Facebook pages and they're not getting any work done. So, you want to block access to Facebook. Okay, so how do you do that? Okay, first, first pass at it, you just say, okay, um, add to output uh, destination www.facebook.com. Okay, how many addresses do you think Facebook has got besides just www.facebook.com? Lots. Lots. So you're kind of stuck. You, 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 you put that rule in. That doesn't stop your employees because facebook.com resolves to a lot of different addresses. But how do you find out that whole range of addresses? What you can do is issue the host command host command dash type dash t a which says all facebook.com find out that facebook.com is an alias for that thing star dot whatever facebook.com okay and it has this particular IP address use the who is command on that address and get for inet number and it turns out Facebook has this block of IP addresses. Wow. So now what you do 
is you write a CIDR description, common internet, classless internet domain routing, for that particular block of addresses. And you prevent it with that. Add to output TCP on ETH0, going out to ETH1, destination, that CIDR block, drop, poof. Now, yes, sir? It's not work with, my understanding is that there's a bunch of different ways of flavors floating around out there. Well, there's... Do you them, or does it have to register? No, that it, no, there, well, there's, there's Aaron and uh, RipNet and all that, but this works. This works. Um, so now, yes, sir? Would that prevent someone coming into Facebook from a proxy? Um, no. That's what all no. the kids are doing. They're using the proxy now to get to Facebook because their employer blocks. <coughs> blocks, blocks. Um, depends on the proxy and where it's placed. Yeah. Okay. Now your employees, they can't get to Facebook. Well, guess what? Uh, you get a bit of backlash from your employees about not getting to Facebook. So you decide that you're going to relent a little bit and you say, well, okay, we're going to let you have access to Facebook at lunchtime. So you can actually use IP tables to open up that access by time. Um, so what you do, Say I'm going to allow HTTP and HTTPS to come in on ETH0, go out ETH1, and I'm going to load the time module, and I'm going to set it to start at 12, and I'm going to stop at 1 p.m., and the destination is that whole CIDR block, and I'm going to say accept. So anything less than 12 noon is going to get dropped. Anything after 1 is going to get dropped. But anything inside that time range, IP tables will let go through. So now your employees are happy. They can get to Facebook. And maybe they're getting some work done otherwise. But this is really cool. You don't have to write, you only have to write one rule to make this work. Another possibility that you can use this with. Um, let's assume that you've got some downtime in the morning that you need to not have your systems available. Um, you want to cut the network traffic off, say between 2 and 3. This way, using these two rules for both TCP and UDP, you can limit your network activity so that you don't have to worry about anything coming in uh, while you're doing your maintenance schedule. Okay. Um, Here's a very common thing if you're connected to the internet. I have to deal with this all the time. A bad actor is attempting to DDoS my web server or your web server. One of the things that you can do is limit the number of connections a single IP address can have. Instead of the bad actor going out there and slamming you with thousands of them over a very short period of time, you can limit how many they can have. Um, I'm going to add to input that it's TCP, and I'm going to specify that it's multiport because I have 80 and 443. And I'm going to specify that I'm going to use the connection limit module, and I'm only going to allow 20 connections per IP at one time. That will cut them off. It will also throttle your web server down some. Maybe your web server is just getting a lot of traffic. Maybe, maybe it's legitimate traffic, but you want to throttle it down. You can use this same technique. Another possibility is that you can limit the number of connections an IP can make over a period of time. For instance, I'm going to limit 80 and 443 to at most 10 connections in 100 seconds. That requires two rules. Okay. This is the latch that sets it so when a new connection comes in over these ports, IP tables will make a little marker that says, okay, this IP address came at this time 
I'm going to remember that. This one can be the trip for that latch. So that if the IP address has had more than um, 10 connections in 100 seconds, it will drop it. IP tables have set that up in the, in the table when the connection has come in, and it counts the number of connections that's been made by that IP address over that length of time you've set. And if that has happened, poof, away it goes. Question. Yes, sir. In that top line where it says D dash D, I assume that's supposed to be dash dash D. Uh, yeah, that's an unfortunate consequence of PowerPoint trying to help me. <laughs> Gotta love PowerPoint. Yeah, that should be dash dash state there. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I have an example here using um, HTTP, HTTPS. You can use this for other ports as well. Uh, for instance, SSH. Um, I have servers that are out there that researchers around the world can SSH into and uh, do, their, do their stuff on the supercomputer. And so consequently, I frequently get hit up by all of these brute force SSH attacks. And I used similar sets of rules to these, except instead of using ADN 443, it was just port 22 SSH. And I put these in while a brute force attack was going on. Um, and it, looking at it over time, it ramped up, was real high, and immediately when I put these rules in, in addition to that connection limit one that we saw earlier, it just plummeted. Cut them off at the knees. It works really good for rate limiting against your brute force attacks. Okay. Um, so this seems like it would be a good default rule to have for almost anybody. Um, yeah, uh, it would be a good possibility for anybody to have, um, but uh, that depends on what your, your policy and what your risk profile is. But um, uh, I have it on quite a few of my servers that are on the internet and it works really, really well. Okay, um, how about monitoring IP tables? Is there something like IP tables mon or a top for IP tables or something like that? Well, no, there isn't, but there's other things that you can do. Um, you want to monitor your IP tables in a, uh, in, in a manner analogous to uh, top. Use the watch command and close the command that you want to do. And it uses curses, so every five seconds it will run this command and put it up on the screen. Um, now, I, I, this is important. The number of spaces here, there are five spaces in between those zeros. And what you do is you get something that looks like this. And boy, did that come out bad. <laughs> yeah, that came out pretty bad, didn't it? Okay, well, you never know until you get it on the big screen. But anyway, the reason for that grep command is that we are end up throwing away the connections, that are, the, the rules that are not being active. So this only shows you the rules that are in play. And it shows it to you by the particular table, by the IP addresses. These are the ones that are getting rejected down here. Okay. Um, there's another Perl script you can get from Perl monks. There's the URL. Um, this is in the slides which have been loaded up. And it does a much more comprehensive display. And let's see how this one comes out on the big screen. Oh, that's somewhat better. It does some nice things like rules that are firing get highlighted. I tried to catch this when a drop rule was firing because if a drop rule fires, it's red. 
So this is a very nice display to see what's actually hitting. Um, that's just a little Perl script. It comes from perlmonks.com. Okay. You can set up some very nice rules to do some interesting things. You can there's a couple of different ways that you can watch what's going on with your IP tables rules in a dynamic fashion. But reporting on things is the final frontier, or at least I think so. So you or your boss comes up with the idea that, gee, all of this dynamic stuff is real great, and I can sit here and watch this all day, and it's just really cool. But I need to have some kind of report. Bosses love reports. Um, FW report from SourceForge. This takes your IP tables logs that are going into var log messages or var log syslog and creates reports for you. For instance, you can create a daily report or you can create a monthly report. It allows you to, um, here's where I put on my sales support sort of hat and say it allows the system administrator to free up substantial time, maintain better control over security of the network, and reduce un <coughs> unnoticed attacks. Well, maybe, maybe it does all that. Um, but it's certainly good for generating a report over a long period of time, for instance, a week, a month. And I have an example. And that's actually a little bit better. Um, Shows you where you're getting hits from. Uh, if it can, it uh, goes back and resolves it to a name. Um, seems like there's something I want to say about that, but okay. Um, visualizing IP tables logs. Your boss comes to you and he says, you know, it's getting time for the monthly ops review. And it'd be really nice if I had some great graphic to throw in there that shows how, um, how our firewall is keeping us safe. Um, turns out there is something that you can do. Um, if you were in my uh, presentation yesterday where I was talking about PISA, the port scan activity detector, um, it has some wonderful capabilities built into it uh, for interfacing with GNU plot, but it also has the ability to create stuff for Afterglow and GraphViz to do IP tables logs. You point a PISA at your IP tables logs from bar log messages and um, you can create uh, output from that that's in a CSV format that you feed into Afterglow and GraphViz to create some really nice pictures. Um, here is a URL for how you can go through it. And what I did for this is I took a month's worth of IP tables logs, fed it into PSAD, Type that into Afterglow and then into GraphViz and created this. Here's my system at the middle. Here's everybody that's tried to attack it. The, um, the light blue is TCP, the dark blue is UDP. Very busy, very busy little system. Everybody's going after it. Yes, sir? What's on the red? The red, those are the bad guys. Those are the bad guys that are trying to get into it. Those are the IP addresses associated with it. Yeah, hey, it's, it's busy. A lot of people are after it. Okay. Um, this is all coming in. You can do one for going out. This is everybody that it tried to talk to, and um, blue is ICMP, because that's what was being blocked. How are we doing for time? Oh, boy, I'm really, thought I was going to have, uh, this is going to be longer. Okay. Um, there's lots of things you can do. 
to keep from locking yourself out. Um, there are lots of tips and tricks for IP tables. Probably could have made this long. I could have made this longer. Um, for instance, one of the things that you can do, uh, you can block by country code. Say that you don't want China to come in. You can block by country code. You can block, for instance, Russia. You can block by those. Um, there's, there's other things that you can do for blocking. For instance, uh, you can say, I'm not going to allow any Windows operating system to connect to me. You can actually do that with IP tables. Um, this is just some of the tricks, little tips and tricks that I found for doing things with IP tables, all the way from blocking things to visualization to monitoring. Yes, sir? Can you block by Windows version? Can you block by Windows version? Uh, as far as I know, no. So, in other words, you want to say, I want to block XP? Uh, no, no, it, it, it's not really, I don't think you can get that level of granularity. Um, you can do that at layer 7, so you'd use like squid or something to detect that. And yeah. Response. But this is not, uh, no, no, this isn't really gra that granular. This is, this is based on technology from something called... Um, Passive OS Fingerprinter P0F. Um, there's the specification for TCP/IP is is got a lot of wiggle room in it, and not everybody implements the TCP stack exactly the same way. For instance, uh, the TTL, the Time to Live. Um, there's a difference between Linux and Solaris and HPUX and all of the various flavors of Unix. Um, since Microsoft implemented their own TCP IP stack, they used a different value of TTL to start out with. That's how you, one way you can tell it. Uh, also by various flag bits set in the TCP header and the IP header that you can make guesses about um, what level of the OS it is. Um, somebody asked me yesterday, could you, can you limit it by uh, Linux kernel version? No, it'd be nice if you could do that, but uh, no, you don't have quite that level of granularity, but you can get it down to the OS level. Or you can permit it by the OS level. Um, there's a lot more to IP tables than just accept and drop. Yes, sir. Uh, on that note, is it at all possible to limit uh, connections by process? So like on the output, if I have a certain process that I want to just like whitelist or something, would it be possible to do um, Yes, you can limit by process on output. There's no way to do that on input because right. you, you have, it'd be nice if you could, boy, would that be great. <laughs> no, but you can, you can uh, limit by um, what process coming from the inside, from the inside going out. Okay, so there's can actually, a switch you, there. Yeah, you can do that too. There is a possibility for that. I don't have that in there. That was just one of those things that I, I just didn't put in. I'll read the fine manual. Well, um, you know, there's there's so many different things that you can do with IP tables that it's it's that there's not like there's an IP tables book which has got them all in it. You kind of have to read the fine print and 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 try what works for you. Like like those rules that, that do the rate limiting. I came across that while I was looking for something else, and I go, oh wow, I can use this for something else. I need to mark this bookmark this and come back to it later. Yes, sir. Uh, how easily can these tips be turned into uh, end of tables rules? How can they what? How easily can they be turned into uh, end of table rules? Um, I think that's that's going to require human intelligence. Um, actually, he's brought up a, a good point. Did everybody know that IP tables is on its way out? Um, IP tables will at some point be replaced by N-Filter. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done on that, so um, um, it's not going to go any way anytime soon, and there's still going to be a compatibility layer in there at least for a while. Um, one of the things that I have always had a little bit of a concern with on IP tables is... Um, well, let me back it up. 
for just a bit. Um, I've always had a little bit of trouble with the rather Baroque, that's B-A-R-O-B-A-R-O-Q-U-E, not Baroque as in B-R-O-K-E, Baroque syntax for an IP tables rule. There's, it's pretty complicated. And Infilter hopes to get away from that. Um, another thing about IP tables is that there's multiple versions of these table manipulating programs. There's IP tables for IPv4. There's IP6 tables for IPv6. There's one for uh, manipulating bridge filter rules. There's another one for manipulating arc filter. Well, why do you need all of those? And which, which one do you pick to do what? Well, it's kind of complicated. That's one of the things nFilter hopes to do, is to consolidate all of these into one program, <coughs> one syntax, to make it all simpler for you. So you can kind of think of nFilter as maybe it's like the Lord of the Rings, uh, one ring to bind them all, and in the darkness bind them, or something like that. Um, I'm keeping an eye on it because um, to see what happens. Uh, has anybody read Fred Brooks's book, The Mythical Man Month? Okay, you have, you have, okay, you have. Okay, do you remember a topic in there he calls the second system effect? Um, the second system effect, according to Fred Brooks, is a, what happens when a group of people get together and they're going to make the next version of a particular product. They want to make it neat. They want to make it grand and glorious and they want to do all the things that they weren't able to do in version one. So consequently it ends up being hugely bulleted. More features than anybody could ever want and I'm hoping that Infilter doesn't go that way. Um, so I will be interested to see how that one finally plays out. Yes, sir? Uh, on my wireless router, I wanted to have, uh, it's got the capability of broadcasting two SSIDs having two separate connections. I wanted to have one, I'm sorry. I wanted to have one be uh, connected to directly to the internet but no access to my LAN and the other one be password uh, uh, protected and all that stuff, but allow access to mm -hmm. my LAN. Uh, do you have any ideas on setting up the rules for that? Mm, never tried that one. Um, or like, uh, let, let some computers connect. Um, Possibly, yeah, you could do it that way. Uh, possibly what you could do is only allow certain MAC addresses to connect. Uh, that's one of the things, that's, that's a very unused feature of IP tables, is you can allow connection by MAC addresses. So you could make all of, say, all of your home, all of your home, gather up the MAC addresses of all your home systems, and just put in rules for each one of those saying, okay, this IP address can do it, this IP address can do it, this IP address can do it. That's one possibility. Is there a way to, to set that rule as a login type thing? Or mm, you might have to do that more. Of a, that might be more of a layer 7 kind of thing. Yes, sir? I still have uh, different types of wireless systems for uh, small businesses, and they have a lot of like, consumer <coughs> uses. Is there a way to get devices to only uh, interact with other certain IP addresses. For example, the use of IP saying would be uh, customers have, uh, uh, clients have customers come in wanting to use the network, but they don't want them to be able to access their Apple TV to stream mm -hmm. video, for example. So they want only internal devices to be able to access the Apple TV's IP address. Is there a way to make it so that certain IP addresses uh, can only interact with other IP addresses on the same network and split it all up? Oh. Probably want to use subnets. Yeah. Subnet, yeah. Yeah. 
that's going to be tough to do. Um, well, so long as you're using the Linux yeah. box as a bridge, you yeah. can do it. So, yeah. uh, so long as you've got a layer two bridge going on, yes, you could. Yeah, um, you could set up a like a visitor LAN with um, with its own DHCP server for that particular thing, and. Um, I guess the big issue is I've had a lot of clients, and I, I usually set it up so they're separate networks, but mm -hmm. I've had a few clients specifically request they want one network that everyone can connect to, so both customers and themselves, and just split everything up on the network. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I told them. Yeah. They're the ones who pay me. If you have two access yeah. IDs, you might be able to set like, yeah. the DHCP pool to a certain range, and then just that's, you just filter them out by that way. Um, there, there, there are some intelligent access points that can figure out where you're physically located in the plant and grant you access that way. And I'm trying to remember who made those. Because I had that problem back when I worked at Motorola, is that you didn't you depending on where you were in the building, you could have different access. Like for instance, if you were, if you're in the cafeteria, you could access your mail, but you couldn't access any of the servers that you were working on, developing stuff. But once you came inside out of the cafeteria, which was basically open to the general public, yeah, then you could get to your servers and manipulate uh, the code you were working on. And I cannot for the life of me remember what the name of that particular access point was. But um, usually, if you tell your customer that if they store any kind of personal information or credit card information, just by law, they can't keep it together. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I noticed uh, early on what your example was the uh, drop, drop, drop for the input, forward, and output. And a lot of times, uh, first of all, I don't deal with Windows Phone, so I'm pretty much letting it um, If I were to use the default of uh, um, drop, drop, and uh, Except for the output, mm -hmm. which is pretty common for like a, a home machine thing mm -hmm. the internet. Are there any security implications for that if I'm not running Windows? Because I'm typically not going to have a Linux box connecting out to anything on other than anything. So um, I run it wide open on the output. Um, well, who is using, who's using your, your home systems besides yourself? Myself and my kids. Uh, well, you really trust your kids, don't you? Yeah. Well, they're adults now. Oh, okay, they're adults now. I was, I was thinking of, uh, I was thinking of fourteen and fifteen year olds. I had a whole firewall set. Okay, yeah. Uh, if it's just, if it's you and you trust your users, that's fine. That's that's within. If that if you feel comfortable with that within your risk profile, sure, that's fine. Um, uh, if. I don't have 14 and 15 year olds at home, so I would be, um, I would be, if I did, I would have a little bit more um, a desire to control where they could go out to. Um, and in fact, uh, there's, um, that's where whitelisting comes in, where you would whitelist where they could go to and just not rely, uh, have uh, allow them uh, unrestricted and unfettered access to uh, HTTP and HTTPS. But yeah, just allowing output, mm -hmm. since you have a reasonably good risk profile at home, yeah, that would certainly work. You know, in, inside my corporate environment, I'm, I'm inside a corporate firewall, and I've got a bunch of servers, and I still run them with output wide open, but then restricted coming in. Okay. No forwarding. And I don't, I don't yeah, see yeah, this. turning off. Turning off forwarding is you, is generally a very good idea. Um, uh, sometimes um, people don't realize that there's there's actually two forwarding two two forwarding parameters. There's the one inside the kernel, and then there's setting it up in IP tables. And what they do is is they just say, okay, I'm going to turn off forwarding in the kernel through syscall. Boom. Okay. Well, that's that's fine, but you can still do it through IP tables too. And that's actually I think. It's actually a good idea to do both if you don't want forwarding, because that's that's that defense in depth thing.
Other questions? Do you okay. have this uh, PowerPoint presentation online? Yes, I have uploaded it to, um, to the Linux Fest Northwest site, so it is available. Thank you. Thank you for coming.